Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Carla Howell. I'm the uh, UL system content expert for research and grant writing. And I'm currently the director of purchasing and sponsor programs administration at Northwestern State University. I have co-presenting with me today, Cheryl Hall. I'll let her introduce and tell you a little bit about her. Good morning, I'm Cheryl Hall from Southeastern Louisiana University. I serve as the Director of Sponsored Programs here at Southeastern and have been in that capacity for the past 13 years. I'm just excited to be here this morning to share with you and gain some knowledge and give some knowledge. So welcome. There you go. Between Cheryl and I, sitting here thinking about it, we've got a little over 40 years of uh, taking care of <laughs> lots of programs and research administration that, hey, we learn something new every day, every yes, we day. Do. We're going to uh, go over a few different things here. First off, what we want to ask is for you to please share your thoughts, share any questions. This is not a topic specific webinar. We're just talking about what's going on at our universities. We're going to go through, Cheryl will start going through the internal routing processes. And I know that those vary at their different institutions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about any successes that you have, any failures that you may want to have you discuss. But let's, um, we just kind of have this as an open forum. Um, you will have to put your questions or what have you in chat, and we will go through those. We're going to keep this pretty informal, and we want to thank you for joining us. And please share, you know, whatever relevant information that you may have. Um, or, and as we go through this, uh, anything that comes up, anything that pops into mind, it's, it's wide open here. So. With that being said, we're going to start out with like the internal approval processes, and those do vary at each institution. So you'll have to get with your sponsor programs office. I was looking this morning, just looking at some of the institutional websites. Um, Louisiana Tech has an electronic internal routing process, and I love it. I sent the link to my associate director and said, we got to figure this out. I mean, it just, it, with, it's the times, it's the sign of the times. Um, we're still doing a hard paper routing around and we, we do take electronic signatures on the form now, but it's not an electronic system. So Cheryl, you want to give us your take on internal routing and what you yeah. see that varies amongst us or? Yes, I will. I'll, uh, thank you very much, Carla. So Southeastern moved to an electronic uh, routing process a couple of years ago, maybe we were second year in. So we use Workday. So with that process, now the first thing on here is a notice of intent to the Office of Sponsored Programs. We only use notices of intent for those projects or uh, funding opportunities that require a notice of intent. Board yeah, of external okay. projects require a notice of intent. Uh, if it doesn't require a notice of intent, most of the times um, the grant specialists here in the Office of Sponsored Programs work pretty closely with their particular faculty. They're assigned by colleges. So they might give them a call, shoot them an email and say, hey, I'm interested in submitting this particular pr proposal. Now, if it's a proposal where only one or two, three can go in, then we may reach out to that particular college or department and say, hey, this opportunity is out there. Do you have anybody interested? So that way we will know if we have to vet it up the system to determine which one can go to represent the university or not. So with the internal routing process by the PI or the project director, that starts in their particular department and then it moves to their college. Once it goes to the college, then it will go to the um, Institutional Research and Oversight Committee, which oversees IRB the Aya Cook and the recombinant DNA at your respective institution. Now, depending on what your research uh, study is, you may need human subjects approval if you're going to have humans in your uh, project. Some people conduct surveys in their projects uh, with particular persons, so they may need IRB approval. Aya Cook approval, we have several of our faculty that, that do bat research, snake research, <laughs> use mice. OK, and they have to get our IA cook approval. The recombinant DNA is a recombinant DNA molecule, and you may need that approval from the recombinant DNA committee if you have such at your institution. Uh, Carla, you have anything you want to add at this point? 
Well, I was just thinking, and it's back at the beginning at Northwestern, we have a notice of intent. I guess you'd call it a form where mm -hmm. you go. It's a non-binding form and it's more or less a heads up to our office that I'm looking into this proposal. There's no signatures required. They just fill out five or six blanks online just to give us uh, the date. The agency sent us a link to it where we can look at it and say, hey, we've had one of these before. Or right. we haven't had, let me see if I can find someone that's been funded with this and I'll reach out to sometimes to the other institutions. So on our notice of intent, that, that's kind of how we use it. So if you're on here from one of the other universities, would you mind putting in the chat if you have a notice of intent, um, if it's required, if it's not required, and um, just if it's, you know, that's a simple process or not. Let us know your thoughts on that if you don't mind. And like Cheryl said with the other things, most of these informations are uh, is asked on our internal rally. Okay. Next on our flow chart is export controls. Now, I think Carla probably will agree. We could have a whole session just on export control uh, within, it, within itself. So basically export control laws, you know, they control the conditions in which certain information, uh, commodities and our technologies can be exchanged uh, to anyone overseas or a US citizen who is overseas or a foreign national here in the United States. So that's a big area uh, now with national security, as well as moving into our foreign sponsors. You have to be well aware of who may be on the debarred institution list as a foreign university. And also if any prior approvals are required to do work with a foreign sponsor, either through your institution, through your system, or uh, the type of research that you're doing. Carla, anything you want to put into that? No, I think you covered that. I mean, that is just, a, it's a hot topic right now with everything that's going on across our nation and it's something you got to be aware of. I can't re reiterate enough to get with your sponsor programs office. Yes. Make sure mm -hmm. that you've got the latest uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. Correct. And often know that you can be approached by someone uh, that you do not know is doing business with the foreign government just by asking you to collaborate or do some research or even uh, put in some type of uh, knowledge basically to review something for them on a project or a study. So you have to be aware of all the caveats and things going on in working with a foreign, a foreign sponsor or having a foreign sponsor as a part of a foreign entity as a part of your project. Now, when we move from the foreign sponsors, FNA, FNA is a big deal um, on your proposals. I tell my faculty, FNA is how we stay open and how we keep alive. When you don't have to waive FNA, we don't here at Southeastern. If the FNA is there for us to get it, we want it because that's how we keep our doors open here at uh, in sponsored research. Now, if the FNA is waived, uh, sometimes they require a letter, or sometimes if it's in the uh, funding opportunity that says they don't pay FNA, which is indirect cost, if they don't pay it, then we make note of that in our file and keep that data uh, available for future reference when we see we don't have FNA in the proposal. Carla, what do y'all have rules governing the FNA? FNA, we kind of follow the same thing. If they allow it, we need to get it. It's it's what has your keeps your utilities on, keeps our office you know here and available. Um, for years, it was IDC and direct cost, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what everyone over the, I, I don't know, I guess it's been probably ten or fifteen years the federal government decided to call it uh, the FNA waiver. Uh, Facilities and administrative costs. That's what right. FNA is. Facilities and administrative cost waiver. Um, there's been a few times where we've negotiated a smaller. Well, we could take less. Um, and when you have a federal proposal, all of us should have a, a federally negotiated, approved indirect cost rate. Ours is based on salaries and wages. Um, I'm hoping that we, maybe we can get that change to uh, MTDC, material total direct cost. 
um, cause it applies to more cause it's, we don't right. have as many, uh, as much funding here with, uh, salaries on it because we are not a research intensive university. Correct. Um, uh, do y'all, how is y'all's rate calculated, uh, Cheryl? A years ago, we changed from, uh, salaries and wages to modified total direct costs. Mm -hmm. So our rate is 38.6% of modified total direct costs. And what that means that includes everything with the exception of 25,000 of sub awards, your equipment and things of that nature. But you are absolutely correct. It causes you to realize more money that you can put back into. Sometimes it goes to the department. Sometimes it goes to the dean's office, sponsored programs and keeps the lights on at the institution. In the past, we used funding from there also to do internal grants, so little seed grants, just a right. small program for our faculty to be able to apply for. Of course, you know, with the budget cuts, so they kind of took it back, but we still, um, our hopes is to get that back. Uh, I know our indirect cost rate is coming up for renegotiation next year, so I'm gonna get with our, our CFO and controller and try to look at, because I think we need to start now trying to find a, you know, a firm to help renegotiate that and look and see what exactly. we can do. But contact your sponsor programs office. A lot of these terms, you'll see them and they're foreign. And like I said, you may still see indirect cost on some of your applications, um, but you'll see f &A waiver. But generally, you know, if they've got it, if the sponsoring agency has it in their budget, then they, they're they okay with you putting it in there because they understand that there is overhead costs associated. Right. And um, I'm a former federal employee, so... I can tell you that the rates that we use, 38%, some schools have 54%, it still comes out cheaper for the federal government when they're dealing with their big contractors like uh, Boeing for aircraft, because they have F&A, they have a burden rate, they have an employment rate, they have so many other rates that they factor in to the proposals that they submit to the federal government for work that I was just a drop in the bucket and a really a cost savings to the federal government when we're doing various types of research. Now, moving on to cost sharing. Now, our rule of thumb here at Southeastern is, if it's not required, you don't put it in. There is no such thing at Southeastern as voluntary committed cost share. Now, I don't know if many of you um, work with NSF, but NSF is one of the few agencies that does not require cost sharing and that's a good thing because cost sharing can sometimes be a one-to-one -one match on your proposal and then on depending on what your school has or uses for cost share it's sometimes difficult to come up with a cost share most places uh schools institutions use space sometimes you can use a faculty's uh release time um and things of that nature, but the space is our biggest one that we try to use. And sometimes the release time uh, as a form of cost sharing. And if you take a reduction in the indirect cost, you can use that, the difference, like on your board of regents projects, you can use the difference of your actual rate and the 25% that they prescribe you use as a, uh, as a cost share. Carla? And that's on the, the R&D program, right? The, right. The, for the 25 and the enhancement, there's no indirect cost nope. allowed on it. Uh, uh, yes, cost sharing, same thing. It, it, and that's a daily struggle with me because everybody wants to put more in their will for show. And you do have to show your institutional support mm -hmm. uh, and that the, the institution is backing your project. But if cost sharing is not required, don't put it because anything that you put in that proposal for cost sharing you are held to. You have to, the auditors come in and they want to see the documentation on that. On the front end here, if we have someone with third party cost sharing, or we ask for a confirmation on that. We, want, we have to have something in writing to support any cost sharing that is submitted on an external proposal. Our internal routing form, which I'm sure, you know, all of you do, we, we want that cost sharing identified, specified out, because if that grant is awarded, your accounting office has to be able to go in and directly identify all of that cost sharing. We ask for the budget unit head who's over the account that's doing the cost sharing to justify it and, and you know, show that we did do our match on that. Because some agencies, if you don't 
if you're not able to provide the match that you committed, they're going to reduce the amount of funding that you receive. Right. Um, you know, we've seen that happen before, but yeah, same we, thing. Thing here, <laughs> we require when the proposal comes in and there's a cost share uh, commitment, we ask for that budget unit number on that form so we can make sure that at that time, yeah, they have these funds available to meet this cost share commitment. So we do ask that the budget number or some type of number that correlates to that car share account is placed on that uh, proposal routing document. I'm gonna, now, I'm gonna well, back up on something, Cheryl, and ask you, um, because we didn't mention this in the beginning. What is your timeline? The proposal routing is to be done before the proposal is submitted. Now, if it gets submitted, we, we ask for it afterwards because we've got to have all that information, but right. you know, you could get your hand slapped. Um, we reserve the right to have to reject the funding if it's awarded, if it was did not go through the proper approvals before it was submitted. We ask to have a good draft and a good budget and the proposal routing form 10 days before. Rarely does that happen, but five days is just the minimum. What, what kind of timeline do y'all put on it, Cheryl? Well, we ask the same thing, 10 days. Now, with our Board of Regents submissions, the provost has asked that she has 10 days herself to review. Oh, wow. Okay. At that right. rally. That's interesting. I, know last, I don't know what went on last year with our competitions, but I know we were like two and three days before mm -hmm. uh, submission time, still working on some proposals. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it was just ridiculous last year. And I, I, and you know, we give our faculty a lot of leeway because we know their primary job is to teach. Right, here. right. But well, we're here to help. So we ask, you know, send us your, your narrative, send us your drafts. Let us, you know, give you some feedback on it to help you while you're putting that file right. together. And also the internal routing process, I, my associate mentioned yesterday, she says some of they, they act like we're hindering the process, but we're not. We're Correct. helping the process. We're protecting you. We're protecting the university. We're helping, you know, we check for things that you as the faculty member may not, you know, think about. We make sure you follow that font, you follow those margins, you follow those guidelines. Um, and some, you get a, if you put an extra page in there, there's a 20 page limit and you got 21 pages, they're going to throw it out. Well, you're busy looking at your content and, and <laughs> writing your proposal, making sure you express your ideas. So, I mean, that's the kind of things that, that we can help with and, and that we look for, I know, in here. And I'm not sure about the other institutions. I think it's, you know, overall the same. We don't, you know, dig into your area, your expert area, but we look for all the formatting type things and, and you know, make sure that we've got everything in there. Correct. Same here. We actually, um, if you tell us if it's not the Board of Regents or whomever it is, NSF, first thing we do is we go pull a copy of that RFP. Mm -hmm. We highlight that RFP, look to see what the requirements are, as and especially, like you said, when they lay it out, the, how the proposal layout has been. Now, sometimes we get proposals. It may be a resubmission. That person may have submitted three years ago. They'll give us that same proposal, and the format has changed. And we have to tell them, no, this is your old proposal. You have to follow this current RFP. So We have that a lot when the Board of Regents has changed their... Right. So Carla is absolutely correct. Whether it's NSF, NIH, Department of Education, we look at the formatting because you don't want to get your proposal that you've done all this work on thrown out on a small technicality. And some people think formatting is not a big issue, but for some people, agencies, that's no, that's the way they can exclude people because they're getting thousands of proposals for each competition. So yes. We look at those things. Now I have some professors, English is not their first language. They ask us to say, hey, would you kind of look at my grammar and make sure this is correct? But we'll do that. We'll provide that service. But as far as your science or whatever your research or your study is, that's not our field. We don't look at that. We don't try to change that. We're just making sure you're following the RFP and everything that they're asked for, asked for in that RFP is included in your proposal to give you the best shot. That's it. I think there was a, was there a question in the chat? No, I was telling you, to, to share your thoughts, your processes, let us know. 
but it says it's going to host a panelist. I'm hoping that the attendees can see it. Uh, okay. Carla, you need to do the drop down next to it that says uh, host and panelists and change it to everyone. I don't have an everyone option. Anyway, while we're looking into that, we'll go on a, where are we at? Uh, intellectual yeah. property. <laughs> so I know the UL system as, as well as each institution should have an intellectual property policy or intellectual property statement. Southeastern's policy is um, a direct result of the institution, UL systems uh, policy. And basically what this is, we have a form that we use. If a faculty member wants to announce uh, a research project and he's, he or she is claiming ownership to that project and through the intellectual property of the particular institution, it determines your split. If you have something you think is patentable, if there's a 70-30 split, 60-40, all that will be detailed in the intellectual property policy um, at your institution. We have a form that the faculty person can fill out if they think they have something that we call discoverable in their project. A lot of times they may be going to do uh, a presentation a speech or what have you on some research. And they may think they have something that's discoverable in that particular research. Well, the best thing to do is have that particular faculty person fill out the intellectual property disclosure form. And that will cover them and it will cover the clock that's ticking once you have something that you think is discoverable, meaning patentable, that you may want the university to look at and have the IP committee review. Carla, you want to add anything? Uh, we do the same. We emulate the, the the system policy and go from that. We don't, again, once again, you know, being a PU out, we don't have a lot of research in intellectual property. Some of your bigger institutions, you know, will have that. Right, right. I know uh, it's been about 15 or 20 years, 20 years now. Southeastern, we have a professor here with two patents. So every couple of years, I have to go in and um, pay the patent fee for those two patents that the university um, has. But yes, we have another professor a couple of years ago, he uh, received a patent on one of his research projects. So it does come up not quite often at teaching institutions like we are, but it does come up. Um, pers personnel concerns. Well, sometimes on these projects, uh, there's a need for research associates uh, or other positions on your project. So I ask that you, you know, talk it over with human resources uh, and especially your department, because if you're gonna be adding personnel to your department or college, I think the department head would want to know that he's getting a new faculty person because you wrote this into your project. Uh, Carla? Yes, that, I mean, that seems to be never any issues coming up with personnel. Um, you know, there's always a concern of hiring someone on soft money. So generally, we'll, uh, I know here we, you know, generally it's not a full time faculty appointment. It'll be a, a hourly person, a wages of labor per se. But there are limits with civil service and all as to what you could put in those type of positions. Um, fringe benefits. I'm going to bring that up. Uh, every. A lot of times, what is that? What is that? Why do I have to have that? Well, that's the university's cost of having that person employed. If they are being on a, a regular appointment, if so, you know you are able to do that, then they they can have insurance. The university can have their portion of the insurance. They will have their per portion of the retirement. If you're hiring a wages person or a student that's not enrolled this time, say in the summer, you're going to have a uh, FICA and Medicare. And you're going to have to have that percentage added in your budget to cover the university's portion of that. Um, the university will have some set rates generally that they'll tell you. If you know specific who the person is, then you can get better accurate. We use a, a pool budget amount and then the actuals are charged if it's awarded. Uh, how do y'all, what y'all's rate that y'all currently using, Cheryl, on fringe so benefits? Our fringe benefits rate is 38%. Mm -hmm. Now, like you said, if we, if the PI knows the person that they're going to be hiring and that rate is going to be lower 
then we'll go with actuals. But if not, not exactly. we'll put in the 38%. Mm -hmm. We have research projects where we have hired in the past mm -hmm. uh, research technicians under those projects. And like you said, they're temporary positions because they are externally funded. And at the time you're bringing the person on, please let them know that these are externally funded positions. And as Carla said, AKA soft money positions, and they may go away when the grant goes away. So they need to be aware of that, especially if they're a full-time uh, position that's funded over the grant. Now, another thing that a lot of people do not realize, if you have someone that resigns or retires or leaves the grant, sometimes there's a payout that's associated to that grant that uh, grants accounting, HR has to pay for that person retiring, resigning, uh, or what have you from a, from a project. And those costs are added to that particular grant. And you might say, oh, my budget is short. And they say, well, you know, so-and-so resigned and we had to do a payout of X, Y, and Z. And you go like, oh, I didn't know that. So be aware of those funds perhaps coming out of your budget. And that's Carl, it. the personnel issues. You want to try to head those off when you're doing your proposal. You don't want to get the money and then come in and have, oh, we don't have enough to cover it. You've got to look for it. You've got to take it from somewhere else. Another thing that I thought about when Cheryl mentioned about someone leaving, if you've got a PI leaving, you, you know, know your process that you have to take to replace them. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a case where they've transferred the project with them because it was their specific research and, and there are certain things you have to do with the agency for that. Um, or, you know, you've got to know with the department head internally if someone's taking over that project on campus, you know, you've got to notify that agency and go through whatever uh, procedures that they have in place to do a change of PI. We get, um, and I've only started this the last few years, is I, the week, there's a weekly memo that's sent out by personnel, uh, resignations, retirements, transfers within the university. So we have them send us that and we go through that. If there's anyone on there that's on the grant, then we have to determine how is that going to be handled. So the same thing here, um, I think for the past five or 10, five by five years, I get an email how often as it comes out with the persons that are uh, resigning, retiring, uh, or leaving the university in some of, by some other means. And I go through that list and what I do is I'll look at the list and compare it and it'll show what area they're employed in. I immediately contact, if they're not the project head, I immediately contact the project head to let them know as well as the department, hey, this person is leaving. And I also use it as a tool in my office to make sure we have the necessary closeout documents. If we have their time and effort reports, if they're the PI, if we have the project report, depending on the date they, they're leaving, when is that final project report due? When is an annual project report due? I use that to make sure when that person is leaving, we are not in a lurch to say, hey, we didn't know he was leaving. Well, he didn't turn in his final report. And then you say, well, we don't have nobody, anybody to do the final report, that you're not left in a lurch. So that's correct. It's good to let HR know you need or want to be on that distribution list so you can handle uh, your externally funded projects accordingly and not be caught off guard knowing, not knowing that, hey, somebody's gone and we have this project that I have to now answer to the agency for. And sometimes there's repercussions that reverberate to other areas because that person is gone and they didn't meet the requirements of closing out that project in the proper manner. And Cheryl and I are hitting on these, these are things that the sponsor programs offices needs to be aware of. I know I've got some of our sponsor program offices, offices represented on, in, in here, but also as a faculty member, you know, it's good for you to just know that this is a process and, and this is something that you'll need to address if you find yourself that you have an award and you're being transferred to another university, leaving the university. This is, you know, something you need to be aware of and, and, and want to take care of, too, because it, you know, it can be a reflection on you and follow you if you leave things unresolved, unfinished, reports undone. Cheryl mentioned on something else that we may want to talk about a few minutes, time and effort certification. Uh, a lot of new people coming in, a lot of new faculty that they're lost. They don't know what we're talking about here. At Northwestern, 
um, ooh, I remember setting that up some 20 something years ago, but we send ours out twice a year is how we do it. Some people, some universities do it by semester. Some, I think it may have been done in annually, but this is where you have to report the percentage of time that you're spending on a project or, or multiple projects and divide it out. One thing is we have to be sure that you're not over committing yourself um, amongst too many projects. Uh, Cheryl, how do y'all handle time and effort? That's time and effort is handled in sponsored um, research. And that's one of my babies. I handle the time and effort. Um, and it somehow it didn't get put in the workday system. So it's still a manual process. <laughs> so we try to do it, well, yes, every semester. But if not every semester, fall and spring, we may let them combine together. But we try to do it every semester, send out to persons we know are on externally funded projects or send it to the department heads and then have them send it back to us and we keep a log of it and maintain it here in the office to make sure the persons are not over committing and they're committing that the amount of times that they said they would commit to a particular project. And that is a federal uh, policy and that is something that your auditors will pull. Especially Correct. when you have uh, commitments on federal projects um, mm -hmm. with personnel. But, you know, I did mention this also, we're talking about our office sponsor program structures, like some do just pre-award, some handle pre-award and part of post-award, but, you know, it's good to get to know your university's organizational structure on how it's handled. Uh, we were recently moved from under one VP to the VP of business affairs, so we've got post-award right around the corner, and we're finding that to be very helpful. Cheryl, do you, so I consider time and effort a post-award duty is that uh how does your office function there we we, we strictly handle pre-award and we do post-award administration okay gotcha so we then only the post-award administration and what that means is we do not handle the fiscal invoicing or fiscal reporting okay. that's handled by our grants accounting office okay good deal uh Looking at the overall approval and submission now. I think we touched on right. deadlines a while ago and getting your sponsor program office involved early. So, Cheryl? Yes, yes, we would appreciate that. Because please understand, I know at some of the larger institutions, they have very large sponsored research offices. But most places I've worked in state and out of state and know of the offices, like if you're at a primarily teaching institution, are not very large and people wear several hats. Um, like Carla's wearing two hats. Um, I mean, I wear two hats. I do sponsored research and I'm tasked with the intellectual property. So we ask that, you know, you, you get your stuff in timely or before time to give us the proper amount of time to give you the proper advice um, to get having a successful project. I do realize I skipped forward. I went to the wrong side of my chart here. Computers and, computers and technology. Um, we implemented several years ago that all of our internal routing goes through our IT department because sometimes things are computers or technology that we don't catch. Uh, we, several years ago, but we had someone did a board of regents proposal for some type of uh, computer lab. And once we got in there, the the lab wouldn't support the technology needs. And so we had to find funding to do some renovation things in there. So usually your IT people are the experts on the computers and on the technical needs. So get with them as soon as you know, if, especially if you're doing something in a, a computer lab. I mean, you need their input. Um, Cheryl, do y'all require yours to go through IT? If there's not, not everyone, but if we get the proposal, I t I t let's, let me back up. Board of Regents, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, because those are mostly enhancement labs. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's another agency that the person is submitting to and we see there's a great amount of technology in that particular proposal, yes. We, we will tell them to send it or we will send it to our ID department and say, hey, give a look, see it at this particular proposal to make sure, because that is absolutely correct. You may be purchasing or saying you're going to do something that's not in line with the university or your institution's setup, IT setup, and, and it can be quite costly. 
and to make sure you've got all the pieces of equipment that you yes. need. I'm not a technical expert and you may be buying Either. this that requires another box over here. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not going to know that, but your IT people can help you with that. And they can help you with the prices. I can help you get your quotes, uh, you know, and tell you where to go. We take some of that burden off of you during your budget process, help you right. determine what would be the best equipment to suit your needs. What is it that you really need? Are you looking at desktops or laptops and, and you know, what the, how the function will be and, and what would be best? So we try to try to do that also. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now moving to our renovation and construction costs. I know this one all too well. Um, about 10 years ago, we had a Board of Regents proposal and they were proposing a nutrition kitchen lab uh, in one of our buildings here. And we had to do just this get with our physical plant so they could come in and measure the room, get specs of the room, work with an architect for the room to make sure everything was in proper order um, for the university one and two for the cost and three that met with that particular proposals, what they said they were gonna do and how they were going to do it. Now. Board of Regents doesn't pay for construction, but you can, what we were doing really wasn't considered true construction, but we still had to get our physical plant involved uh, with this particular project as far as the costing and doing something to a state building. Well, and sometimes you'll, in situations like that, we're working on a proposal too for our, to redo our, uh, our kitchen and all the culinary uh, department, but you may need um, wiring done. That's that's 220 instead of 110. So you're gonna have to bring in your physically plan mm -hmm. on that. Uh, I can remember something about having to have hoods tore out yeah. or redone. And yeah. you've got codes and specs that have to be met here. You you have possibly have a fire marshal come in. So your facilities plant's going to know whether or not you're you're meeting what you've got to do there. Um, uh, we've had cabinets and walls, and things like that, that have to be torn out. And a lot of times, if your physical plant is doing that, that can be an in-kind match also if there's a requirement there. You're going to be using the university's you know resources to come in and do that part of the construction and the renovation, like she said, and on the board regions, we have run into that. We've had to have a better ventilation system put in in order to support uh, equipment that's been put into a lab before. And it's definitely another reason to, to reach out to them when you start looking at if you're gonna be making some major changes to a room. Correct, that's correct, I agree. Now, our next box is Dean VPR presidential approval. So once you've gone through this entire process, um, our, our deans approve, I think, kind of up in the beginning by the department head, but thereafter, the VP president approval. So for us, we're under the provost office. So once it goes through all these approvals, it will go to the provost for approval. When the provost approves, um, then it will come back. We don't have a presidential approval for most of our proposals. It stops with our pro, uh, provost. Then it will come to the Office of Sponsored Programs for final approval and submission. And in that submission, um, with the new, all the electronic ways, if you've got a proposal that's being submitted to uh, a foundation or a, a, what am I trying to say? A private entity, a company. We we try to get, if there's no way for them to include us in that proposal process, then we, we, we have to have screenshots of all of it. As far as anything that's submitted with the federal government wide, our agency has the grants.gov registrations and approvals. And we, we've learned how to do the workspaces, you know, so mm -hmm. we can put a PI in there to work on it. Um, I maintain our SAMS.gov registration now that it's so tied with everything else. Uh, how do y'all handle when they're submitting them well, electronically? If, when they're submitting electronic, like you said, if it's grants.gov, uh, research.gov, that's NSF, mm -hmm. or if it's something with NIH and those agencies, we are the submitter. And the OJ, we do that, yes. Better. Now, if it's for a private foundation or some other um, 
organization. And some of them will say, hey, the PI can just email it. Mm -hmm. Then I ask if the PI can email it that they CC us on the email. So that's how now, we hear also. It's, everything is filled out in the system, like let's say Dollar General. If it's filled out in the system and an email is just sent, what I ask is that the PI allow the specialist in the office to do it and submit it. We and if it can't be done that way, same as you. If it's submitted, once they get that, uh, hello, welcome, this is to acknowledge your proposal has been received, they'll shoot that over to us for our files and recordation. And do you, you try to use one unique university address on all of your applications, external yeah. applications? We use one unique university address. And we're trying to do that, but it, 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 that's that's a regular challenge. And we're trying to make the departments understand that, you know, having a centralized office for mm -hmm. everything to come into because so much correspondence will get overlooked and get missed. Yeah. yeah. We that, we try to do that also. That's that's that has been the process. Um, and like you said, about 13 years back, sometimes the, the PI would put his department at PO box number or address. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we said, no, it's going to be one succinct, one centralized place. Because if it, the award is made to the university on behalf of the faculty person. So the university is the ultimate agent and ultimately responsible for that project. So the one address we use is the sponsored research address for all proposals that are going anywhere, external funding. Uh, but some applications, I know like the NIH will allow the PI to list his departmental address, but the central address is sponsored research. Right. right. Wow. We could have done a whole session just on the internal routing process. Oh my, yes. <laughs> So much more. And I know, I mean, our faculty come to us and our staff, you know, with how do I fill this out? What is this? And and, mm -hmm. and it's just so important. We maintain a database of all external funding that's submitted and we use that routing form for our information. And right. Like, and on the flip side, it's for the protection, for your protection, the university's protection, mm -hmm. you know, for us to be able to be involved, you know, in that process and help you as much as we can through that process. So let's see here. We were asking to tell us about your successful propose, proposals. Um, I don't see anyone putting anything in here on the chat. So everybody's kind of quiet this morning. But we are doing good on time. One thing we have a few minutes we're still going to touch on is unity of strength. When there's teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can be achieved. So what we're, we're looking at here is the system office, I know, is trying to do more things with all the institutions, bring the institutions together. We've thrown around a few possibilities, looking at some cybersecurity proposals. Um, there's been a few things that we've looked at. So collaborate, collaborate internally. Know who your PIs are that have written proposals. Uh, share your topics. We use InfoEd. Well, all of the institutions have InfoEd now, um, except UNO. And you can go in there and put in your common interests and there's ways to find out, you know, other PIs that are looking at these same topics. Uh, you're always, it's always stronger when you can get more on your team submitting for a proposal, especially when you're going for the large proposals. They look at the faculty expertise. They want to see the, the range of individuals that you have working on that project. Cheryl, some thoughts on collaborating and... Um. I find that my professors in the sciences collaborate more than some of my other departments. I'm hopeful that we can find collaboration more with our arts and humanities areas and our um, um, college of business. But the sciences look like I, they can easily find collaboration opportunities with other faculty members at other schools or other institutions uh, that they may not even know, but they have met at research symposiums or things of that nature. But I'm hopeful that we can find more collaborative opportunities for our uh, College of Arts and Human Humanities, mainly like our history, our psychology and areas like that. 
and we do and we need to we need to get our get our institutions together on some some of these and submit some as a system or groups of two and three institutions right. we've done several but i see a lot of opportunities that would it would make us a lot stronger on it would that's it uh so don't wait for the right opportunity you got to create it get that idea think um you got an idea look for the funding source that meets it um that's what we that's what we're here to do we we want to help you we want to help find the money get the money and Cheryl's gonna help take care of it afterwards too. <laughs> yeah. so any thoughts any questions that anyone has on what we've talked about thus far everyone's ready that's on here's ready uh y'all are being awful quiet I, I think we have it now where you can chat well, I'm going to go ahead and share mine and Cheryl's information and our pretty little pictures on here where you can jot down our information. Feel free to reach out to uh, one or both of us. I can't, I, I know I've said this over and you probably, but reach out to your sponsor programs office at your university. Yeah. Um, we have a cohort group of us and we, we share thoughts and ideas of problems and processes and, you know, we're, we will reach out to each other to help make some connections if you'd like for us to make those connections. But that's what we're here for. We're going to have a feedback form, I believe, a link put to it in the chat. Katie, are you going to be able to get that up for us? We appreciate that. Go into Moodle. Um, this is a course as you had to register in Moodle. We'll be having resources on there. We can share information in there. If you think of something later on, you go in there, you know, put it in, in the discussions in there and we can hit on it. We will be having a course on Thursday, and if my mind is right, it's going to be on budgeting, all about budgeting. I believe Debbie will be joining me from uh, Nichols again on that. Well, it'll be a lot of information covered in there. It's going to be kind of like the internal routing. Budgeting is a, it's an animal all in itself, so we should have a lot of valuable information on there. I, Cheryl, I can't thank you enough for today. I think this You're is most great. Welcome, We're good tag teamers, and I'll probably yeah. be reaching out to you again. Please. Um, okay, she's got our link. She's got our link up to the form for the feedback. We appreciate that. Give us your thoughts. Uh, let us know what else you'd like to hear. If there's some other topics that, that seem foreign to you and you need some input, just let us know. All right, everyone. Okay. We'll have a good rest of your day. And I'll be back on here Thursday morning with Debbie. Yeah. Thanks again, Cheryl. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye.